Center, uh, who has been instrumental in uh, the designing of the Mustang Marquee and uh, currently leads the brand for battery electric vehicles uh, for Ford, along with Chris Walter, who is our design manager for Marquee. Uh, both of them will take you through a, their design journey and walk through on the product and what really uh, went into making this product so exciting uh, for all of us. Um, a couple of uh, rules. Uh, there will be um, adequate time for some Q&A. Uh, 30 minutes of presentation by both Jason and Chris, followed by the questions. Uh, we request that you post all your questions via the chat column to all panelists. Uh, in that case, uh, I can see the questions and uh, hopefully we will get able to get to most of your questions and Jason and uh, Chris would be able to answer them. We also have, we are very lucky to have Mark Kaufman uh, with us as well today. Mark uh, Kaufman leads uh, Team Edison and uh, the battery electric vehicles for us. So he would be also be available for any questions that you might have. So with, without much ado, I would pass this on to Jason and Chris. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Jason. Sorry, everybody. Hi, this is Jason Castriota. Thank you, Bodhi, for, for the great introduction. Uh, you know, as Bodhi mentioned, uh, I was the chief designer of the Mustang Mach-E, and I'm now global brand director for battery electric vehicles for Ford. Uh, Chris Walter, my colleague and friend, uh, is our design manager for the project, and saw this project all the way through to production. So uh, I'll pass you on to him a little bit later. But needless to say, we really appreciate your guys' passion, your enthusiasm for the Mustang Mach-E. We certainly hope there's a lot of reservation holders in the audience today. And as a token of our appreciation, we really wanted to pull back the curtain and share a little bit about the story of how the Mustang Mach-E came to be. Um, as you guys can imagine, this is really a paradigm shifting vehicle for Ford. You know, this is the first extension of the Mustang family, you know, one of the most iconic names in automotive, 55 years of history going strong. And this is Ford's first all battery electric vehicle, fully battery electric vehicle. So needless to say, there's a lot of passion in this project. And for us, it's fantastic to share it with a passionate group of individuals like yourself. So that's an image of, of Chris and I, because sorry, we don't have cameras working this evening. Uh, uh, we're happy to be here in voice. As I mentioned, you know, we're ushering in a new electric era at Ford, and the Mustang Mach-E is just the first of several really exciting products that are gonna come to market in the coming years. You may have heard already that we're actually investing $11.5 billion into electric vehicles over the next couple of years. Our goal is to deliver exciting and capable fully electric vehicles. This is really the key to the success not just for Ford, but also for our customers. We want to deliver vehicles that customers can be passionate about and really thrive in. Early on, when we started to sketch out what our strategic approach would be is, we really knew we wanted to build a long-term foundation of success in the battery electrical vehicle space. So this wasn't about doing quirky one-off vehicles to meet compliance. We wanted to create vehicles that people really wanted. We wanted to play to our strengths. We wanted to build on those iconic nameplates that we know and love that really amplify the best attributes of them. And this again would allow us to leverage the scale and technology to deliver a better product to our customers at a lower cost, a really innovative business model. So as you, can, as you guys have probably seen, uh, the F-150 all electric that's gonna come to market soon that we did this phenomenal teaser of, uh, and of course, the Mustang Mach-E. These are the first extensions uh, into the battery electric vehicle space of our most iconic nameplates. This may seem obvious to you guys because you have all decided to invest in a battery electric vehicle, but many people don't realize battery electric vehicles are far more than just an alternative form of propulsion. It's really about the access of connected ecosystem features and services that we can really deliver because of all this great power on board. This is gonna deliver more freedom, more empowerment, and of course, a more progressive product for a better future. And this is something we know our customers care deeply about. As I mentioned earlier, 
battery electric vehicles really give us the ability to amplify attributes our customers really love. So we are going to create vehicles that are really fun to drive. Um, you're probably aware that you know high powered battery electric vehicles have fantastic acceleration. They also have an exceptionally low center of gravity. So even in an SUV body style, you get a car that handles and rides phenomenally well. From a design standpoint, the skateboard type chassis is opening up all sorts of new avenues for us, you know, not just in the silhouette innovation, but also in how we use that interior space. And of course, the vehicles are quiet, and we certainly are looking to achieve a lower total cost of ownership, and of course, no more gas. So when we really dug into how do we deliver all of this, we looked at some really important proxies. You know, and we think about customers like yourselves with growth mindsets, forward looking, very tech positive and progressive. We knew we needed to lean into the tech industry and really see how tech had created systemic elegance for everyone. How people have, for the past decade, really been seeking these amplified products and experiences that were once ultra premium, but have now been democratized to the masses. So, just like Henry Ford democratized the Model T, democratized transportation, something that was only for the elite at the turn of the century, everyone is being able to experience these elite services right at their doorstep, whether it's ordering a black car from Uber or having a private chef or tailor with a Freshly or a Stitch Fix. And then again, the experiences, how experiences are changing, growing, amplifying to become better, to be more tribal, whether it's you know, exercising in a community or across the world with Peloton or this combination of gaming with VR, AR, and drones. Really immersive experiences that our customers really so this mantra of gotta have new experiences became really important to the project. You know, we connected experiences with the Mustang Mach-E, as you probably aware, we're gonna have over the air updates. So we'll be able to push everything from upgrades to fixes to fun novelty Easter eggs into the vehicle. And of course the new usable spaces that that architecture gives you along with eventually portable power. And that really brings us to what we want to talk about today, specifically Mach-E. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when we talked as a team about playing to our strengths and we were going to really make the foray into our first all electric vehicle, we knew we needed a new hero. And for us, a hero ve vehicle has to really tie in deeply into the emotions of the customer. It has to be a product that's must have. It's got to challenge convention. It's got to be more than a car. And that's Mustang. We own Mustang. Only Ford Motor could make a Mustang Mach-E. And as I mentioned before, it's not just about challenging convention and being more than a car. It's really about capturing the best of the American spirit and be a must-have product. Mustang for generations has represented fast, fun, and free, and the Mustang Mach-E will deliver on all of those caveats. This is really about expanding a legendary brand to develop this deep emotional connection with you, the enthusiast, and deliver a very clear brand promise. When we tell you it's a Mustang, not only is it going to look like a Mustang, it's going to feel like a Mustang, and it's going to go like a Mustang. And as you guys know, we're adding a new steed to the stable. So this idea of creating a captivating, unbridled, and empowering vehicle, you know, now you can have a Mustang experience all the time. You know, for many that move out of Mustang, it's because the vehicle no longer suits their lifestyle. It's too small or they live in a northeast colder climate where they really can't get full use of the vehicle all year round. Perhaps their kids have grown to be, you know, full size adults and they just don't quite. Mustang Mach-E again gives that Mustang experience back to those who have left Mustang and or further Mustang experiences to our Mustang enthusiasts. As I mentioned earlier, and you know, we'll talk about this perhaps in, in a future episode, the intuitive, adaptive, and fast connectivity is critical to really leveraging everything that our battery electric vehicles have to offer. And the new Sync 4A system, uh, we, we really can't wait for you guys to get your hands on it because it's intuitive and easy to use as your smartphone. And you're going to see again how it removes friction from your lives and really amplifies the experience of driving and owning this vehicle. Some glamour shots for you guys. You know, as, as designers, it was really our desire to create something bold, capable, emotive, and dynamic, something that would live up to the pony that's on the vehicle. Mustang Maki certainly does that. 
We also wanted this to be a very usable vehicle. So of course, it's got to have ample space for all your gear. You know, you need to be able to use this vehicle in day to day, taking trips, going on your own adventures. And of course, the interior and one of the things that we're always pleasantly surprised about when people see the vehicle for the first time in the metal is just how roomy and spacious the vehicle is. Ceramic roof option gives an incredible light, airy feel to the cabin and makes the vehicle feel even larger. So now, without further ado, we're going to really dive into how we got here. So you guys have seen the glamour shots, you've, you've heard the pitch, you're interested and excited and enthusiastic about the vehicle, but it was a, you know, it was a very uh, fascinating journey as to how we got to the Mustang Mach-E. And with that, I'm going to bring on board my friend and colleague, Chris. We're going to walk you through how we got here. Hi, thank you, Jason. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yes, yeah, so Jason and I worked very closely on this project together. We've got a lot of great memories, a um, lot of lot of interesting struggles, tensions, but we we got through it, and we were super excited with the result. Um, you know, the Mach E is really different than any previous car design that I've ever worked on before. You know, because it's being an all electric vehicle. Um, you need to have that look and the feel of that part, but at the, at the same time, taking the design performance and the spirit cues from the iconic Mustang. So when you think about the iconic exterior cues of a Mustang, you think about the long, powerful hood. You know, that always is kind of a muscle car indicator. You know, you've got the, the rearward biased cabin on the body, a powerful rear haunch, which is huge. You have that high nose, which has that kind of like that shark nose profile. Um, and then just the full body throughout 55 years of passion, you know, the 55 years of passion, you know, you see those tri bar tail lights and you say to yourself, and you know, with the, with the Mustang racetrack and you say, wow, you know, you can just see it going down the freeway or down the highway you, at nighttime, you see those tri bars and you know, it's a Mustang and there's creative tensions, uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the development of the car within the company. Um, Jason, if you would like to expand a little bit on some of that, you might be able to do it a little bit more eloquently than me. <laughs> well, you know, as, as, as you guys uh, in the audience can imagine, uh, you know, going to our leadership, uh, everyone from the, the CEO to, to Jim Farley, who's now COO, Hao uh, Tai Tang, head of product development, and of course, um, Mr. Bill Ford himself, our, our president, uh, to talk to them about creating a new Mustang was certainly an exciting proposition, but when we said, well, it's going to be electric and well, it's going to be an SUV, uh, you could imagine there was some initial pause in, in the room and some tension in the air uh, because, you know, these are the family jewels. You know, the Mustang, as Chris mentioned, is, is 55 years and, and more now of, of passion, enthusiasm, and great iconic product. And the last thing any of us wanted to do was uh, to you know, mess with something that was uh, really a, a pretty good cocktail to begin with. But we felt really confident that, you know, given where we could deliver in terms of design style, in terms of performance, fun to drive, that we could really grow the Mustang brand for the, the first time. So, uh, you know, of course, with that, you know, there were a lot of design tensions in particular, and Chris and I will walk you through those. Um, you know, before Chris, before you jump in, um, if you guys can look to the upper left corner, you'll see what we kind of call a generic um, green car silhouette. And we've even we've even made it a green silhouette. Um, you guys have seen a lot of cars on the road like this. Um, you know, I call them dust busters, you know, kind of a mono volume type shape, uh, very low nose, very fast, long windscreen, um, no real power to the vehicle. They, they look kind of almost like door stops or dust busters, as I mentioned. Uh, because it's a, it's a clean aerodynamic shape and of course with electric vehicles range is really affected by the aerodynamics of the vehicle so when we decided to go mustang and start to build in those really important mustang attributes that chris was talking through from that shark that high shark nose the long hood the powerful rear haunches and i'll let chris go into more detail this of course created other challenges and uh, the team uh, and chris especially in, in his job did a phenomenal, phenomenal effort to ensure that we arrived at the aero efficiency 
but delivered that Mustang flavor in essence. So Chris, why don't you walk them through all the massive architecture changes and what makes the Mustang Mach-E so unique versus a lot of vehicles that are in the same class? Well, thanks, Jason. You know, you know, looking at this graphic, everyone, if you look at the start at the front of the car, and the, the, the most important part of the, we thought was, was we had to lift this nose, you know, and, you know, again, electric cars, aero. Well, you know what? It's we've got to do it. We lifted the nose. If you get that shark nose profile, we take the A pillar of the vehicle, we pull it back. So we want to accentuate that long hood. Um, we uh, also, if you follow from the A pillar, follow along the roof rail. We've uh, created a roof rail. Uh, excuse me. We've created a roof rail that is very Mustang inspired from uh, like the coupe silhouette. And it has this uh, unique design to the to the roof center line where you you get really optimal space for rear occupants. However, um, you have that visual from a side view silhouette that you'll see. Uh, well, you've seen in pictures that really um, accentuates that sportiness. Um, you know, the, the, the part that I'm going to refer to, and, I, and I'll tell you a little anecdote about it later, are those rear haunches. So we really wanted to push the rear haunches out wide. Uh, another important part about great car design is, you know, it's the proportion, and this is what we're doing. We're tweaking the proportion. Uh, the better of a proportion of the vehicle, the less tricks that you have to play uh, on styling to try to hide a bad proportion. So um, the wheelbase is a big thing. Right. So when, when you when you have more of a premium kind of Mustang feel, you want to push that front wheel forward. And we we pushed it forward about 70 millimeters um, to get technical about it. We also took the rear wheel and we pushed it back. Uh, you know, it did a couple of things. It helped us out for proportion. It also helped us out to package batteries. Uh, but that long dash to axle is an important part of, uh, of what makes the silhouette work. And I think, Chris, you, you hit on a really important point. You know, uh, trade-offs are a massive part of design. And as, as Chris mentioned, you know, some of the choices we made um, created new challenges. So, you know, raising the nose of the vehicle and, you know, pulling the A-pillar a, a and windscreen rearward created more challenges to arrive at the low drag coefficient. But we were able to, you know, do things to uh, effectuate that regardless. But what we did gain, for instance, is a much larger front trunk area or front area. Um, so, for instance, a lot of electric vehicles that may claim they have a, a you know a substantial front trunk actually don't. Uh, you know, as Chris mentioned, lengthening the wheelbase and and moving up to larger wheels and tires also gave us more capacity for battery. So, you know, these trade-offs uh, may seem negative at first, but then you can find new positives. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Chris and the team and and the aerodynamicists worked exceptionally hard um, you know, in the wind tunnel, in virtual reality, to ensure we would still hit those arrow marks. And, and we are really proud of what we've achieved from this car uh, to make sure that in certain iterations, as you guys have heard, we can deliver that magic 300 mile range or more. So uh, yeah, it's a critical part. Chris, is, is there anything else you want to touch on, on on this slide? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, we, we can touch a little bit about the, the aerodynamics. Um, I will say one more thing about that though. Uh, it, we have a nice smooth front end and that does, even though we have a high nose, uh, we have a clean smooth surface on the front. Obviously you don't need a grill up front, but we do have somewhat of an implied grill shape. Uh, we, we dubbed it the horse collar and um, it kind of that, uh, that grill motif, uh, it, it kind of nicely frames our classic running horse or pony up front, but it has a kind of a fresh electric vehicle take on the front. But that, that smooth front end did, even though we lifted that yep. nose, did help aero. Absolutely. So, so with that, um, you know, I set, I set a pretty hard, high bar for the team. I, you know, I, I took Chris aside and I said, all right, we, 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 we're going to make a Mustang guys. Let's, let's have at it because this isn't going to be, Grandpa's Mustang. We're we're going to pull Mustang into the future. This has got to be a really progressive product, and let's let the young designers push us to the edge, and then we'll pull them back. So, Chris, why don't you run them through the the design process? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. I, we we did. Jason was right. You know, um, it, everyone was energized. Okay, so in the we 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 essentially unleashed the design team. You know, in the beginning, there wasn't a whole lot of emotion around the original design. 
And we could sense that the team felt the same way. I mean, it was kind of, it was a collective feeling. But now that the entire architecture was reimagined and we kind of, we, we achieved truly Mustang type proportions, um, at, you know, the entire design team from across the globe, they were hungry to put down the proverbial pen to paper and just let those creative juices run wild. Um, you know, our, our talent, talented designers, you know, they were trying to quickly answer the question, how do you create this all electric Mustang SUV? Uh, like uh, when it's never been one of those things before, a Mustang or, you know, an SUV, an electric. Um, and it was just overwhelming on how many great concepts we had to choose from. from. But it was, uh, it was apparent that we needed to begin the step, uh, the next step of our design journey. And that was kind of whittling things down to yep. fo focusing down. So so the next step of our design journey was, um, you know, Jason, Jason and I formulated uh, a plan to create three separate design pillars uh, for the designers to, to develop their ideas, uh, help foster them and, and focus them. And, um, you know, you know, it's a funny thing about the design process. Um, Sometimes you 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 can work better if you have the constraints, you know. And so, you know, if you if you give we gave the designers three lanes to drive in, and um, and these were the ones that we chose. So the first one here we we called it the future of emotive power. Really trying to push it into the future, um, you know. And and some of the some of the uh, very uh, sleek and progressive. Yeah, sleek, progressive, smooth. Um, you know, the second one here we call pure and minimal. And I guess you could say, maybe this is a little bit more of a Teutonic approach, or you know, maybe uh, maybe you could say uh, compared to to, uh, to a German manufacturer that's getting into the EV market. Uh, uh, one of our uh, well, uh, one of the uh, um, um, expensive brands. Um, and then the third one was saying, okay, what if we took um, just the current design Mustang language and we applied it to this this new architecture, which was kind of default, but it was good. It was good to have that. And um, yeah, so as so a, a good checks and balances. Yeah, really. yeah. But I, I like Chris's uh, three three lanes, um, so to speak. I and mean, for those of you who have kids out there, I'm sure you're aware. If you offer your kids, you know, unlimited choices, they'll never decide what to eat. Um, if you tell them, you know, hamburger or hot dog, they'll choose one. So it's sometimes it's it's not so different. I mean, there's there's so much creativity, especially in in young designers, um, that they you know they want to stretch and expand, and it's it's up to old dogs like Chris and I, uh, in a little bit, and, and, uh, give them some direction sometimes. Right. Um, so so you know ultimately. Uh, I'd like to say that the feature of a motive power theme it spoke best to what the team felt was a good balance of oh uh, gosh of mustang guts you know and then maybe a, and then the forward looking kind of aspect to uh to captivate the, the lovers of the new um you know so it's it's this this was again this was the kind of the the, the sketch that was really kind of got everyone rallied around this sketch and you know, uh, Jason mentioned sculptural. You can see that the body side sections are seductive. Um, and again, it's it's like I had mentioned before. It's it's pushing. You know, pushing what what you would think an electric vehicle would be. It's pushing it into the future, but it still hang is hanging on to those those uh, spiritual cues. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a tension. <laughs> Quite a bit of tension to use that word again around you know taking you know what has, what was once even a very brutish you know powerful muscle car which of course the Mustang has become much more refined and um, sophisticated as it's gotten older but but to take that raw power that the Mustang has but then reinterpret it for a totally different type of drivetrain which we knew needed to speak to this idea of kind of moving seamlessly through the world and and clean and green and again being aerodynamic because of the importance of range um, so giving it that that more sculptural power but keeping that that essence of rawness of the mustang and and part of the way we've done that is is the redactive nature of the design and and chris will dive into details about that later such as the door handles but um, you know keeping that purity of form uh, really brings a, an authenticity to the vehicle so um so this is what i say this is what i call moving at light speed um 
So we leveraged some, some really exciting tools for agile development. Um, so we designed the Monkey uh, using this cutting edge software. It includes 3D digital, mol uh, 3D digital modeling, uh, virtual reality uh, was, a, was a, an essential tool for design. Uh, actually, it's, it's interesting to say that nearly all of our initial vehicle models um, that we reviewed with management, they, they were first seen and reviewed in the virtual world. And this was a first. This was a first for Ford. Um, you know, we really pushed uh, because we wanted to also challenge ourselves to come to market, uh, you know, quickly with this vehicle because we really felt we, we had lightning in a bottle. And leveraging the latest technology also lent to new design solutions because it pushed the designers in a, in a different way. Yeah, and you know, and thanks to the vast improvements in VR headset technology, it was it was easier for our decision makers to to go through the process because earlier versions of VR could make people kind of sick. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, this is true. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, we, we we did develop those three distinct themes. Uh, we you know before we. With, before we ultimately landed on the uh, the first feature of emotive power, but um, you know we re we created realistic CAD renderings, uh, but this was the part where we uh, it was time to evaluate these three designs as full size clay mock up models, and these are clay models as you see them right here. Um, and it's the process that, that that we work in car design. This was a this was a picture of a beautiful day here at, uh, at design headquarters uh, in in Dearborn, Michigan, at the, for the courtyard review. We had the three themes uh, realized there, as you can see. Yep. Yeah. The, the you know all the all three themes were ultimately very strong and and worthy of the Mustang Pony. Uh, but where we were really pleased is is that you know our our chief officers really did instinctually know they needed to be uncomfortable. And they instinctually knew that they needed to push for that future of emotive power and, and give us the trust to take that, which is really futured and especially in this early iteration, um, particularly the nose of the vehicle um, that almost has this more, you know, high tech robotic look to it. How do we take that and, and bring in back some of the humanism of Mustang, um, but have it be a new Mustang? and and their trust was really incredible in this moment because this was such a pivotal product for Ford, as you can all imagine, um, that I know Chris and I were, were very honored that they really trusted our, our push to say, let's, let us play with this a bit more, let us, we'll get there. And you know, from there, uh, we went right back into the tube and, and this was actually you know, what I always refer to as the Eureka moment. And uh, you know, Chris and myself and, and two young designers uh, we're, we're sketching away on kind of combining those three earlier proposals and and this this design just popped out and i told chris i said mill it get it milled we're going to show our vp on friday and, and this was a wednesday yeah this model yeah. around in two days and that's why there in the images that the model doesn't even have all of what we call a dynock which is a a film that's painted silver so it looks like paint on the clay model because that's how rushed we were to get this in front of our leadership because Chris and I knew this was the one this was the vehicle. Yeah, this this theme really spoke best to to what we felt was a good balance, right Jason? We we thought it was it it had the spirit of Mustang, but it was really looking into the future and beyond. Yeah, fresh, powerful and it had a had a fluidity to it that, you know, we hadn't yet seen in Mustang um, that we we were all really excited about. And then um, from there, you know, Chris, why don't, why don't you dig into, you know, the fun stuff here? Sure, sure. So, you know, Mustang, we own it, right? So Ford owns it. And, you know, so we, we thought, well, you know, let's let's take these beautiful signature cues and refine the car. And um, so our work wasn't done. We had, like Jason said, we had our Eureka moment, but it was time to, to get back in there and put those special Mustang details into the car. Um, take a look at the front end sketches, and you're going to see a little bit about uh, some of that implied, I, I, I call it a, an implied grill shape. Um, these were really some of the initial sketches that that really kind of led to the, to the final solution for us. Um, you'll notice that the headlamps also have a tri-bar motif, and that relates to the rear, the classic 
Mustang inspired rear end, right? So it kind of pushes through the car, through the, the tri bars, push that, that motif pushes from the front to the rear, or maybe I should say from the rear to the front. But um, the rear end, classic kind of cha uh, cam tail rear end, uh, creates the classic Mustang racetrack that we talked about earlier. Um, and it's a, it's a fresh take. Uh, there's a fresh take on the tri bars, as you can see. And, and uh, the, the, the signature lighting and the LED turn indicators are a really special little accent. And this gives you a, a glimpse at the, the final CAD data uh, that really signed off the project. Um, so this is really a culmination of all those sketches and computer models, um, that Eureka moment model. Uh, here, from here, Chris and the team dove in and there was tons of work still after this, but, and Chris, I'll let you expand on that, but, but this was really what sold our leadership that we could succeed in creating an all electric Mustang SUV. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we started with beautiful classical proportions and that was the key, right? And, uh, you know, so we had that curved and uh, curve uninterrupted roof rail. <laughs> Try to say Nothing that. to say five times. Yeah, right. It provides that sleek profile that we talked about earlier. Um, and it delivers, like I said, that sporty coupe like profile. Um, you know, we, we've, we've got this large smooth glass area on top, taps into the natural light, uh, which, is, which is great for giving occupants that feeling of spaciousness and also adds to the feeling of utility and function of utility. Um, we talked about the tri-bar tail lamps. Uh, it's got a modern twist. The, you know, the body side on this car, you know, there's no door handles. Right, seductive bodywork with deep draw sections, and this car really isn't defined with creases and lines. This car is defined with um, by light and shadow, and when you do see this car outside, it comes to life, and it, it it's just it, even more. You, you when you see it outside it, in the in, in the in the bright blue, you know, the, the clear blue sky and the reflections that run across the body side sections, it's it's really it's really awesome. Um, can you tell that I'm excited about it? So the sculpted hood, right? So the sculpted hood, this is one of my favorite parts, but uh, you know, it's got very expressive sections and and uh, it's evoking that Mustang character in a new fresh approach. Sure does. And, uh, here's, a, here's a great glamour shot of the side view. This is, this is Chris, why don't you walk them through what they're actually looking at here? So what you see here is, is this is, is uh, this is, essentially production production car um this is uh, would be the premium model here that you see um you know before i before i get into talk a little bit more about this if, if i can just say a couple things here you know to me a mustang is an american original you know it it really it confronts that status quo with a with that rebellious nature and its iconic design and I, I believe that this Mustang Mach-E will challenge the status quo in the, in the EV market. Um, you know, our, our, our main design inspiration for this car, you know, other than the obvious, was to push the boundaries of modernity. And, and you know, we asked, this, we asked that question about what's the future of the motive power. And, and the best way I think we can describe it, how we answered it, was with sculpture. More sensual surfacing, just more emotive. And um, so, you know, I talked about the front end with the with the with the with the new kind of original front end that we have. Um, talked about the implied grille, but you know, to sum up, my favorite part of the car, uh, uh, the, my favorite area, I guess, of the car are, are those rear haunches. And um, you know, we all the design team, but we all fought so hard, so very hard to push those fenders out as wide as possible. You know, we worked really hard with our engineering and our manufacturing. We pushed the limits of that super strong, lightweight steel stamping. And I, I just believe we ended up with a beautiful piece of sculpture. And that's what I like to think about this. I like to think about this vehicle as a beautiful piece of moving sculpture, all electric, exciting, Mustang, Maki. Couldn't have said it better myself. There's another great shot where you can really see the, the strength of that rear haunch that Chris was mentioning and the stamping challenges that that presented because of its width and its its depth. 
you know, there are industrial limitations that, that mass production cars have to deal with that, you know, perhaps exotic supercars don't because they're formed in carbon fiber in one-off tools. But um, with a car like this, to have this, you know, an almost exotic nature to it um, and, a, you know, a true dynamic stance and, and strength, visual strength to it, um, you know, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of the team. They, they just did such a phenomenal job. And when people see this car on the road, I, I think they're going to be pretty surprised. Chris, you want to talk a little bit through the, the frontal aerodynamics on the vehicle? Right. So I... I... Yeah, as I said earlier, for the front end design, you know, this is this is uh, an electric vehicle. It's it's not an internal combustion engine vehicle, so um, you don't need that upper grill, and you don't need as much cooling. Uh, you do need cooling on electric vehicles, so there is just to cool the batteries, and so there are um, some active grill shutters below the below the the bumper area. Um, but again, you know, I just allude to this front end shape and, and you remember seeing the sketches that we looked at earlier. We went through a lot of different iterations, uh, a lot of different forms, um, but we ended up on something clean and simple. Again, looking to the future, but also with that implied grill graphic we called the horse collar. We felt like that was, was a, a nice way to frame the car from a front down the road graphic. Um, but yeah, the, the smooth front end. This car, this car does very well in the aero, aero um, tunnel, and uh, we did lots of extensive testing through all the milestones of development. Um, so yeah, we're really excited. And, and it's not a dust, and it's not a dustbuster, like you said. Jason. No, it's it's definitely not. It's definitely not a dustbuster. Um, you know, Chris, uh, I know you worked, um, and I did as well, but you more so than me with, with the color material team. Um, you know, here, here within the deck, we've, we've seen some white cars, a red car, um, a gray car. Um, we do have a couple of very Mustang colors coming, um, you know, obviously, especially with the GT version. But do you want to touch a little bit on, on the color palette and the direction that we took and why? Um, well, the color palette... Um, you know, I, you talked, you talked about the Mustang, uh, some of the classic colors that are coming out, right? So we've got the, the grabber blue, right? And of course you've, you've got to have, you've got to have a red Mustang. So we've, we've got a, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the name that we have for our red, but, um, but yeah, I, the, the color palette, uh, again, you know, with, with some of the tones, we, we had the, the, it looks it looks phenomenal in, in white. Um, we have uh, another color, I believe it's called space white. It's kind of like this cool, really cool kind almost of silver, almost silver white. Yeah, like a space. Yeah, white. it's really, really, really cool. Um, and then of course, I would say most most of the colors, um, most of the that rounds out the palette. Um, I don't actually have them right in front of me, but I I think well, they yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, we do have a couple of, uh, you know, obviously we have the, the traditional Mustang colors of, of red, white, you know, blue, black, and, and silver. And then we have the, you know, the fantastic, um, you know, darker anthracite gray, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the, um, the cyber orange, which is coming later. Um, but, um, you know, with SUVs, it's, it's a unique challenge. You know, they, they are larger vehicles. So uh, I think, you know, again, when people see the vehicle in person, they're always a bit shocked that it's, it's bigger than they thought it would be. I think, you know, again, that that roof rail that Chris was mentioning earlier and that very coupe silhouette um, certainly gives the appearance in photos that the vehicle is very, very small and compact and, and no one expects there to be a lot of space in the vehicle. And then, you know, our, our favorite you know, party trick is to pull our uh, six foot six or seven um, vehicle line director uh, into the back seat and people see that he still has, you know, literally three or four inches above his head in the rear of the vehicle. Uh, so being, a, you know, a, a nice sized SUV, um, it is a, a bit more challenging to put on some of the crazier colors that maybe, um, you know, traditional Mustangs would have, but we definitely have a couple in, in the, uh, in the roster. So we're excited about that. So with that, Chris, do you have any, any closing words? I think, um, I think honestly we can, you know, first thank everybody for listening, obviously. Uh, and 
you know, through Bodie, um, we can actually begin some Q&A. We have, uh, you know, about 10 or 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason and Chris. That was very exciting and great presentation. So there is a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of questions. Thank you, everyone, for sending the questions. I'll try to get through as many as possible, uh, but obviously uh, wouldn't be able to address all of those. But let's, let's keep the mic with you. Jason and Chris, one of the questions that have come in, like, what can you share a personal aha moment from the Mustang Naki development that you, you and the team will carry forward? That was a personal moment for you guys, and that you think like really is something that you will continue. So, yeah, so I, I, I'll take that one first, Chris, if you don't mind. I, I think you sure. know, um, you know, one of the things we didn't touch upon is is that you know before we had a you know, and this is now going back several years ago, uh, before we really had a, a clear vision of our electrification plan, um, you know, Chris and the team had been working on a, on a totally different electric vehicle. And, you know, when Jim Hackett came on board and he pulled us together and he said, you know, he wanted us to really tackle electrification and he created Team Medicine, um, which, I, which I ended up becoming a part of, Chris and I were, were thrown in what we call an energy room. And that's a, you know, a very literally a, a small room <laughs> where about uh, six or seven of us, I believe, were crammed in there from all the major divisions. So you had, you know, engineering, you had, um, you know, battery electric vehicle engineers, manufacturing, marketing, and, and Chris and myself. And, you know, the aha moment when we really were looking at uh, as I meant, as I was talking about earlier, that how technology was really changing the world and how this idea of feeling free and moving fast through the world was so critical to tomorrow, to today and tomorrow's customers. You know, we thought back to the genesis of the 1964 Mustang. And the Mustang was really about freedom over the open road. It was about that idea of Americana, moving fast and free, moving upward, progressing, being aspirational. And that, I mean, honestly, I, I'm not kidding. It actually gives my hair stand up on my arm a little bit when I think about it. That, that was really the moment where I, I said to Chris, I said, it's got to be a Mustang. You know, we need to make a Mustang. And, you know, and then it was kind of in the air because then a couple of other executives came through, um, Jim Farley being the, the big push. Uh, Jim Farley came in one day and he said, you know, we need this thing to be exciting and dynamic and it's got to be a bit raw it's got to be like a Mustang. And so just the world's kind of collided. And, you know, I, I think that for me was really exciting. And, and we began to push that quietly um, because as I mentioned earlier, it was, there was a lot of tension around this idea of, of a Mustang uh, electric vehicle initially. But, um, you know, once, once Chris and the team were able to demonstrate what we could do and, and on the engineering side, um, you know, the, the great work from, from the women and men at Ford who, I said, you know, guaranteed we could deliver a really high performance, high range battery electric vehicle that would live up to the handling and the drive of Mustang. Um, th those are just all great memories and great moments because you really realize you're a part of something that's uh, in the, the history of the company where it's this pivotal moment in the history of the company. So um, it's really the moment that I became very, truly very honored to work at Ford. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, where do I, I mean, where do I start, right? I mean, there were so many, um, there were so many peaks and valleys uh, at the beginning, more valleys, right? <laughs> but, you know, it, when we started out in the project, but I, you know, I, I could probably mention maybe two or three things, uh, maybe not just one. But first of all, without getting too overly dramatic here, when I look back at it, um, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like you're watching a, a, a like a drama movie on how this whole thing played out, um, and it's just so interesting on the whole uh, from where we started and where we ended up. And it's like <laughs> this is going to sound a little cheesy, guys, but it's kind of like you know you're. It's like when you get done watching that that movie that that feel good movie, you know, and you get to the end, and you're like, oh man, that's great. <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt as we, you know, you go through all the challenges, you go through all the struggles and at the end, you know, the good guys win. And, you know, I feel like the whole team at Ford, we were, we really worked hard. And when it, 
when the project, when people really came together and, and, it, and it really catalyzed, the catalyst, I think, again, to Jason's point was, was the Mustang, right? So people, it's like everyone kind of understood that. And there was a drum beat. And so everyone started really, really focusing hard, um, you know, and it was super exciting to see the team, you know, our guys, our team, our the team of women and men just get so excited that uh, to just do the best that they can. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It really, it really did bring out the best in everybody. I think that's, um, again, a testament to the strength of Mustang and, and the men and women at Ford. Great, thank you both. That's, that's great. So I'll I'll go quickly now because I think time is of essence. So there, there was a question on when test drives will start, and I can take that. Uh, the test drive for the vehicle will be starting by end of this year, and um, uh, we will make sure that you get that information closer to the date. But that's where the uh, time frame right now looks. Uh, there is another question, and I will probably direct this question to Mark Kaufman, who is Global Director for Battery Electric Vehicles. Uh, Mark, there has been a question, a couple of questions on the range anxiety uh, topic, and what are we doing specifically by working with our dealerships uh, to look at fast chargers uh, and simultaneously looking at uh, increasing the brand awareness with the public and and handling the and tackling the topic of range anxiety for EV drivers. So, uh, would you like to throw some light on that? Sure. Thanks, Bodie. Uh, no question that for those who haven't been driving EVs, um, just the question of charging and how does this work if I want to take a longer trip? Uh, that range anxiety clearly jumps off the page right away uh, when we embark on the journey of how to put our EV strategy together. So probably the first and most important thing to say, we, we really wanted to make sure that charging um, was easy and hassle-free. And the approach that we've took is we've created a Ford Pass charging network and that we believe that when we launch, we're actually gonna have the, the largest network of chargers available to our customers. And we've been able to do that by essentially consolidating a number of different charging companies, whether they be uh, Electrify, American, others, but making it super easy and convenient for everyone to access that right through either the uh, the Ford Pass app or the HMI system on that nice large 15 and a half inch center screen. And some extra capabilities that come with that is if you're if you're going on a long journey and you're trying to time your stop, uh, maybe at a destination where you can take a food break as well. Uh, we're making it very easy to know what's at that stop. Is there is there food and beverage available? And not only that, but are the charging stations currently open? Uh, from my perspective, I'm one of those people that likes to call it to the last minute in terms of whether I'm recharging or refueling. So the last thing you want to do is wait till the last minute to get into a high power DC fast charger and find out that all the stations are full and then you're waiting even longer. So we've built in the capability for you even to see whether or not the the charge ports at the uh, uh, or the charging station um, is, has available, uh, essentially plugs available for you to charge in. And then the second part of that question, Bodhi, was, well, how about our dealers? Uh, we are having, uh, the dealers are putting charging stations in the front of their store. Um, so you will have an opportunity, um, even when you're, you're visiting your dealer, uh, whether you want to top off your charge, uh, the dealers are working. And, and the, the level of that charging uh, varies by dealer, but uh, the minimum is they're going to have level two chargers off the front of their store so that you can come in, visit your dealer, and top off. Uh, but the charging really, we're trying to make sure that everyone recognizes upon purchase that the, the word of mouth is going to be positive, that we've made it as easy as possible. Great. Thanks, Mark. So I'd like you to keep the mic because great news. A lot of folks have ordered the Mustang mach -E and have been great feedback on how they all like and love the vehicle. So thank you, everyone. We really appreciate that. One of the questions that has come in is on the leasing aspect of it and uh, what happens if somebody wants to lease the vehicle and uh, uh, what is the Ford option uh, looking at? What What is that whole theme looks like? So would you be able to answer that, Mark? Sure, Bodhi. That, that one, uh, first of all, hopefully everyone is aware, though, if you're not, uh, Ford, this vehicle still qualifies for the $7,500 uh, federal tax credit. So the good news is, if you didn't know that, <clears throat> the prices that we're showing uh, on our, our Ford.com site 
are not inclusive of that. So uh, we're trying to make it very clear what the purchase price is at time of purchase, and then what the uh, what that would be with the additional seventy five hundred uh, dollar for the national tax credit that's available. Now, one of the challenges we have with that tax credit is in a conventional lease, um, the the lease uh, the lessee essentially doesn't have the title of the vehicle. So what that would mean for us is, is that as Ford Motor Company and Ford Motor Credit, if you're leasing from us, it, it means that Ford Motor Company gets the tax credit and not the customer. So what we've worked on is something called Ford Option. And Ford Option behaves uh, from a customer standpoint a lot like a, a lease with essentially one difference. And that difference is, is that uh, you, the, essentially the, the person who signs the option actually holds the title until that time when you turn the vehicle back in. So, and then at the end of the lease, uh, you have a choice between a, a purchase payment to essentially uh, buy the vehicle outright, or you have a choice to turn that to the dealer. And the price in which you're turning back to the dealer is already known uh, when you buy the vehicle initially. So in, in a lot of ways, it behaves like a lease, but then you, the individual, actually gets the full, the full tax credit uh, the next time you file your taxes. And we do know, especially if anyone's uh, dialing in line from the Northeast, uh, states like New York, New Jersey, we, we know for SUVs in particular, uh, the vast majority of you really like leasing. So we, we worked hard to find a way to get something that behaves like a lease, but you own the title of the car, you get the full tax credit, and we've made it easy, though, to turn the vehicle back in when the terms, uh, when that, that term expires, uh, which essentially it's, it's almost a... Uh, a, a pre a preset buyback rate, so it, it behaves from a consumer standpoint a lot like a lease. Awesome, thank you. Uh, there was one more question which I can take is on the performance stats for each model. So on June thirtieth, when our order banks opened, uh, we had some updated uh, performance specs. Uh, the four team is, as you know, is always looking for improvements for our customers, and that there were some enhancements in the development work, both on all the versions from extended range, all-wheel drive marquee to the other versions. All of this is available on the website and also on our media site. Uh, if you want to have a, a look at what these performance specs are, uh, do not hesitate to go to any of these platforms, and you will be able to get a clearer idea on what the uh, performance uh, details are. Uh, so I will now go back to Jason and Chris probably. There is a, a, a first of all great uh, comment that the design looks great. There are two questions probably you, which you can answer. Uh, one is that did you have to make any compromises in the cabin uh, to achieve the shell that you desire? So was there any compromise interior wise that you had to make? And uh, following on that is that how does the door, how do the doors work without handles? So two questions around design. So I, I can say that um, we did not make compromises in the cabin. Um, there's a really great uh, visual trick. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let Chris walk you guys through it. Um, Chris, why don't you, why don't you share with them a little bit about the, you know, the appearance of the coupe-like silhouette, but with the ample interior room. Right. So when we developed this car, we, we again, like, like Jason just said, we wanted to have this coupe-like silhouette. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a four-door SUV. So we created a part, I guess we dubbed it the roof ditch, if that makes sense. So it, it's, like, it's like along the edge of the top where the side of the glass and the top of the roof you know, meet, where, where, where that point of the car comes together. Um, and th that is actually always black. And so is the actual, uh, the rear leading edge of the spoiler on the back window. That's always black. Um, now, you can sometimes, you know, you'll have a black roof or you'll have a glass roof. Sometimes you'll have a body color roof. But because that roof ditch is is color coded, I guess you could say a high gloss black, whatever color that you have against that, 
um, you will you will your eye will naturally read the rail. So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a design trick, you know. It's a bit of just uh, uh, you know again, yeah. So there you go. That's a, that's a great shot of it right there. And I will say that the, the image below it, when you when you look at the image right below this, the the blue image, that's a darker color. But because of the section, if I can, when I say section, if you just look at the cross, the contour, if you, you, you look at, you follow your eye from the rear haunch up the side glass over that, over that rail, that, that color painted rail, and then it does another section over the roof ditch area, even if that's a dark color, because of the, because of the section and because of the movement of that, um, light plays on it differently. So even in darker colors, you, you read the silhouette and you, and you see this action. And what they can fit. Chris, I know in the time that I was going into the design studio, seeing the designs progress, I was getting concerned you guys almost did too good of a job, right? Because uh, this is an SUV, it's got more space than a Porsche Macan. And the vehicle started looking so sleek, as you said. I mean, it it really is masterful the way that uh, the team hid essentially the the volume that you get in the vehicle uh, with with essentially that nice fast sleek because the eye really is drawn to that body color line, uh, and it really does hide the the fact that the the roof, especially for that second row occupant in the trunk, actually pops up, and you've got great cubic volume uh, behind the first row seat. Yeah, yeah, I'm really proud. We, we can fit a, a six seven engineer back there, so there's there's plenty of space. Great. So I know we are running short of time. We have like a couple of minutes left, but I think there is one question which I want Mark to address, uh, which is on the whole ordering process. Uh, on like there is a question mark on like they can choose between select premium and California route one, uh, but the GT reservations, do you need to cancel the reservation and go back to the line? Are the GT reservations being uh, penalized? So I'm sure you want to clarify this one for the group. Uh, sure, so first of all, the, the GT uh, compared to the other products did have a, uh, it's got a delayed MP1 date as we would call it, or a delayed production start date uh, as, a, as the performance derivative. So if anyone who currently has a reservation in for the GT and they're just getting really excited to get their hands, <clears throat> excuse me, on a first edition or one of the other vehicles, I should say, the premium series, uh, you would cancel your order. But if you contact uh, the call center, because my, my guess would be there's not many people, uh, we can work with you to try to hold essentially your spot in line. So we don't, you know, we don't want you to feel like even though you reserved uh, and have been with us on this journey starting from the reveal last November. Uh, so because the way the system was set up and because that is a, it's actually a separate program code within our, within our system, uh, the GT reservations are getting handled a little bit differently than the others. But if someone uh, wants to swap out of the GT and they still want uh, early access to the vehicle, uh, we'll, we'll essentially help you cancel your GT order and make sure that you can get expedited treatment for the uh, the vehicle that you're submitting the order for. So, um, Bodie, if you don't if you don't mind, um, before we break, because um, I know we're about time here, um, Chris and I just realized we did not answer the door handle question. <laughs> so, oh yes, please please go so ahead. Yeah, and that we're happy, be the last happy to do that. So, so, I'll, so I'll I'll start with that. Um, you know. For designers, uh, for those who, who don't live in this profession, um, door handles are one of the banes of our existence. <laughs> we we spend a lot of time, and, and Chris used the word quite a few times, to really create, you know, sculpture. And uh, door handles are one of the things that we really, uh, really disrupt the, the fluidity, the seamlessness, the way that light plays across the side view of the vehicle. Uh, so. You know, from a design aesthetic standpoint, we, we wanted the vehicle to appear more sleek. Um, so removing door handles, vision, you know, traditional door handles did that. But further, th further to that, we really wanted people to see this car as walking up to the future. And, and the idea of having, you know, almost hidden door handles that uh, didn't clutter the body design, but, you know, made it, made it clear you were walking up to something different and unique uh, was very important to us. Now, uh, the door handles are actually exceptionally easy to use and um, the six seven engineer that i was talking about earlier uh, darren palmer 
uh, Darren does the absolute best job. It, it's literally a, a touch and pull motion. So uh, above the door handle, and you can even see it actually in this image here um, behind the gentleman that's leaning on the vehicle, there's a small circle on the, the pillar. You literally press that button and then just literally drag your finger down and pull the door open. And it's literally one motion. And it plays again to the idea that we really wanted everything about this car to be very seamless and intuitive. And even though, you know, we've all been grabbing, you know, door handles for, you know, decades, you know, some of us, um, some maybe less. Uh, at the end of the day, this this new motion of kind of just press and pull uh, is almost like swiping on a phone. It really is a very natural movement once you see it. So um, we we've gotten a lot of questions about it. You know, it's probably one of the more controversial aspects of the vehicle, um, but it is one that we're actually pretty proud of. Uh, you know, Chris, do you have anything else to add to that? Well, you know, uh, you know, talking about this, uh, you know, Mark, you had mentioned that uh, in this 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 vehicle has can you you can use your phone as a key, right? So, and so a lot of times the door will present itself, and we also threw out some usability tests in in the company. Um, we found that people just like to have something, just a little something to grab onto too and it was very effortless yeah chris and i think for anyone that has some concerns uh, just to jump in we've got to uh, uh you imagine anytime we're doing something different with uh something as basic as uh the door handle to get into the vehicle we've got a whole team of ergonomic engineers and um it, it is as uh, jason mentioned it is almost a, a one single motion where you're you're literally uh, whether your thumb or finger is touching the uh, the button on the B pillar, and then at the same time you're just pulling your hand back, so it's a it's a super ergonomic friendly motion, and uh, I think the first time anyone interacts with it, the it's actually got a really nice feel to it. So uh, personally, that there's no hesitations at all with uh, how the team's implemented that solution. It's a really graceful solution that uh, I think worked well from from both the design standpoint and also from a usability standpoint. Yeah, I I'll just add one more thing, Mark. I when when this when we got through this and and this we made this happen, I I just was like so excited. Uh, Jason said it as a designer. This was something that just we just thought, wow, this is so cool that we have this. Okay. And again, Great. you know, using the art of blackout, right? You don't even read it uh, from the side view, so you see all the glamour shots, right? So it's only in this angled shot with a little bit of shadowing do you actually see that slight minor little uh essentially finger grab that's uh right behind the gentleman as jason pointed out so um and we're we're, we're pretty confident that that one that uh that everyone's going to love the uh love the, the use of that uh feature great thank you and yes the phone has a key it's cool too and how it interacts with the vehicle but thank you Jason, Chris, and Mark uh, for sharing this, and to all those who attended and took time out. This is very exciting. Um, any closing words from you, Mark, Jason, Chris, uh, in the last one minute? I don't want to keep the folks waiting any longer, but any any closing comments? I just just want to thank everybody for you know sharing their passion and enthusiasm with us for allowing us to you know eat up an hour of their evening uh, with our our design war stories and. Mm -hmm. We certainly hope you have a reservation in. If you don't, get one in. Yeah, maybe just to close the session, Bodhi, uh, on behalf of Jason, Chris, and Bodhi, uh, again, just to reinforce, we really appreciate your enthusiasm for the product and your, your orders for the vehicle. Uh, if you take a moment right before you log off, if you want to put one last uh, comment in for Bodhi to see, uh, we have the potential to do one, one or two more of these if there's enough interest. So if you can give us maybe just a quick uh, chat comment at the end so we can uh, take a quick look at everyone's feedback on, did you find the session helpful? Are you interested in doing one or two more of these? If you found this uh, interesting and insightful, uh, we can clearly think of some other areas to talk about. One is the interior of the vehicle and how the, the vehicle came to be and some of those functionalities of the new SYNC 4A system, which we think everyone's really going to love. Uh, and also maybe even a little bit more about the charging and some of the hassle-free capability. So give us a quick chat comment in the end. Let us know if this is something you'd like us to do a few more of um, because, you know, we, we get excited talking about the product as well, and we love hosting the session. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, Bodhi. Everyone. Thanks for moderating us out.
as well as uh, right. who's out there silently. <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. This has uh, been an exciting journey for us all, and I cannot wait to see these flying down the road. Thank you, guys. We'll log off now. Okay. Bye. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>